Welcome back to the channel. I was recently teaching a class on meta-analysis and many issues came up that are pertinent to the SARS-CoV-2 debate. One was, how can you do a meta-analysis of the global IFR? Well, a lot of people have tried and some people have put forth estimates where they say the IFR is actually higher than you think it is. Here's what the global IFR is. It's 0.6%, 0.6 tenths of 1%, sort of something like that, or 0.1%. And I wanted to say, that when you start to do the global IFR in a single meta-analysis, you're getting heterogeneity that is really, really high. You're getting I-squares that are close to 100%, which tells you that all of the variability is amongst the different studies you have and not inside of the studies. And what you're really doing is you're doing a meta-analysis that makes no sense. You're asking what is the IFR combining places like, say, San Francisco with places like New Delhi in the peak of the crisis. And when you pool these two things together, you end up with an IFR that's not pertinent to either place, that doesn't tell you what will happen in San Francisco, nor does it tell you what will happen in Delhi. It applies to no individual place. So that's a great example of doing a meta-analysis without really knowing what you're doing, without knowing if the tool is useful for the question. And in the course of doing this, the student asked an important question, which was, how do we know what research is credible? And I think this is one of the toughest problems that many people don't fully understand, which is how do you know what's credible, believable, trustworthy? And I think it differs when you're talking about sort of an idea of how the natural world works versus if you want to make an intervention to make the world a better place. So when you think about the natural world, we all know there are things that are deadly. If I got shot at point blank range, that wouldn't be so good. If I fell out of an airplane and landed, that wouldn't be so good. And you don't need randomized controlled trials. You don't even need observational studies to tell you that being shot at point blank range is not so good. You just need anecdote. The effect size is so big, we can see it with our naked eye. And that's how human beings have evolved to see huge effects. There are other effects that are harder to see with the naked eye. Like for instance, if I drink a lot of benzene in my water or lead in the water, will I have bad outcomes? And for that kind of question, you can rely to some degree on retrospective observational studies if they're very carefully done to try to assess what risk factors lead to bad outcomes. You wouldn't prospectively randomize someone to benzene. You might randomize them to a strategy of trying to remove heavy metals from drinking water to see how well they do, but you randomize someone to a putatively beneficial strategy and you're starting to talk about interventions. So let's talk about interventions. The stock and trade of a doctor isn't just to tell people what they have and how they're gonna do, it's to do something about it, to make them better off. And when you start talking about medical interventions, suddenly the rules of causality go up a lot. And we typically do demand randomized controlled trials. But why? Why do we demand randomized trials? Well, the reason is, of course, because what are all the things you can do to a human body to try to make it better off? And the answer is there's trillions of things you can think of. You can think of all sorts of things that might make people better off. And all the faith healers and healers of all times have thought of many things that in modern standards seems quite ludicrous, but they certainly thought of it and believed it was plausible. And of all the things a human being can dream up that make you better off, how many actually do make you better off? And here the reality is we face lottery-like odds when it comes to new therapies or interventions. We can do lots of things to a body. Many of those things are neutral. Some of those things are deleterious, but very few of those things are beneficial. And when they are beneficial, they tend not to have a large effect size. They're not like a parachute. They tend to have a modest effect size like most medical interventions. So in this sea of things you can do to somebody, how do you find the things with modest effect size and separate that from the chaff, from all the things that just don't work or the things that are harmful? And the answer is you really do need randomized control trials. Why do you need randomized trials? Randomized trials, they work on several classical biases in the literature. One, they work on confounding. You balance outcome distributions. You balance the potential role of confounders you know about, but also the potential role of confounders you don't know about. The other thing that randomization does quite well is it anchors the time zero. We know we're all starting from the same time point, which is a classic problem in retrospective studies where you actually have two different start times. You just don't even know that because of the way your study was designed, the inclusion criteria. And the third thing randomization does is it limits multiple hypothesis testing. You can't test every possible combination of things. You have to restrict yourself to hypotheses you think are most plausible, some amount of interventions, but not millions of interventions, and then cherry pick the successful results. So randomization has these virtues, and it works really well to separate modest effect sizes from things that just don't work, which is the vast majority of things human beings have dreamed of for centuries. And the students were a little bit pessimistic. They were disappointed. They said, you know, it's sad that so much of what we do just doesn't help or might not help or is not credible. I said, but look at it from the broad arc of human history. Throughout most of human history, probably the vast majority of things people did in the sake of health didn't actually work. We live in a moment, a rare moment, where for the last 50 years, we actually have some wins. We should celebrate having some wins. It's been worse for a long period of time.
Recently, I saw people talking about a new meta-analysis that suggests that lockdowns had virtually no effect on slowing the virus or on mortality. It had very modest effects. And it's being arguably debated by other people. But the truth is, let's just think about our priors. I mean, we have a respiratory virus that's circulating widely. It's possible that in some places, in some settings, lockdown actually meaningfully bent the pandemic trajectory. But it's also possible, as we saw throughout this country, that a brief lockdown that was done all over the country, a few places that were having explosions, but a lot of places that were very quiet, quickly resulted in a huge amount of the populace who had entirely been fatigued with restrictions. And so when we saw waves in South Dakota or waves in the South, you really were having those waves in a setting where nobody really had political capital and the people didn't have interest in reinstituting some of these draconian policies. You've already burnt it. And so it's very likely that for the most part, lockdowns are like bloodletting. They work under very small and stringent circumstances, but they don't work for most people. So when I see an early meta-analysis that suggests maybe they didn't do that much, I don't find it that incredible. But I also think it's not the right moment to do the meta-analysis because the lockdown's effect is a massive perturbation on the economy and society. It's not just about the short-run mortality. What about the long-run mortality? What about the mortality you're paying for down the road because of all the disruptions to society you can't even anticipate or think about? And we don't know that yet. So I wouldn't even do a meta-analysis of short-term mortality. I would wait until we actually have some studies of lockdown that are credible and pool those studies. And then we should also ask ourselves, does it actually work differently in different places under some settings or not? I think right now there, there are you know, always multiple policy considerations. One policy consideration is in what circumstances does something work? The other policy consideration is what are people willing to sacrifice for that gain? And I think if you have your finger on the pulse of this country, you know that many people will not sacrifice that much more, even for large gains. But that's postulating a large gain, which I think is also very likely to not be true. When these lockdowns were deployed, they weren't deployed with a lot of wisdom or sense. They were deployed out of fear and anxiety, out of political maneuvering, because it seemed like it was reasonable to do. There was a daisy chain of lockdowns because China did it. It opened the door to the West to do it. What was hitherto unthinkable in the West. And people like D.A. Henderson had written that it wouldn't ever happen in the West, but it happened. And it also was facilitated by technology in a way that never existed before. If we didn't have Amazon and Uber Eats and Facebook and Twitter to keep us occupied and Netflix to keep us occupied, we might not have been able to sustain lockdown at all. 10 years ago, we might never have even thought about lockdown. You'd have had to fire a lot of people who are upper middle class workers who are now working on Zoom. And they're, they would not have allowed themselves to be fired or laid off. They wouldn't tolerate that. They would have found some way to get back in the office, at least part time, under some sort of mitigated risk strategy to try to get back to work. And ultimately, what will the final arc of the pandemic be? How many times over will people be infected? I think a key thing is you wanted to minimize infection prior to the risk-reducing therapy, which is vaccination. But now that you have vaccination, what is the goal anymore? What are you trying to accomplish? And I think we struggle with that. We don't really know. So my answer to this person's question is that I do think most science is not credible. It's not true. It's not believable. It's not useful. It's not actionable. It's done to inflate careers and often for-profit entities. People who are anxious and afraid and are concerned, they are likely to err in science. People who believe human beings are omnipotent, we're so powerful, we can shape the natural world to our whims and desires are much likely to make errors. Because the truth is the world is very complicated and we're very small. And even though we think we're so powerful and have a lockdown, we may very modestly change human interactions in a space. And we're unlikely to sustain those interactions, those changes over time. So it, it's very likely to be a very small effect. And in the universe of things people have dreamed about for centuries, most of those things didn't make us better off. They hurt us. They often were self-inflicted wounds. And so the way to separate this is you have to enter a study knowing a lot, I think, about design and conduct and analysis of studies, but also having realistic priors, a realistic sense of what people have accomplished. And that sense only comes from medical history. You need to know a lot of studies. You need to know a lot of studies in a lot of domains. You need to see how wise people have failed as they have over and over in biomedicine, how the greatest minds from the greatest institutions were so passionate with ideas and causes and hypotheses that never really worked as intended. And when you get that broad perspective of medicine, you're not surprised to learn that many therapies that we think are plausible for some disease or some cancer or COVID-19 turned out not to work, that some things we were seduced by that seemed bio plausible, seemed like they had to work, didn't. You won't be surprised to see that when people are anxious and afraid, they would against all reason, close schools, even for prolonged periods of time. 
that they will deceive themselves and tell themselves stories why that's a good thing, even when mounting, mounting, mounting evidence shows that that was the wrong call. And then once people anchor onto points of view, they won't relinquish those points of view. On lockdown, I've written many op-eds, you know, I've written in MedPage, etc. And I truly don't know that I, I cannot say that it never helped anybody. I just can't say that. As a scientist, I just can't say that in good conscience. But I do suspect that for most people, as it was mostly implemented in most settings, it did a lot of damage and had probably had very little upside because it wasn't deployed at the right time. It was done under conditions where it might not work. And it was done in places where you quickly fatigued the populace and then you lost the support for anything when the wave ultimately came and hit you. And so this new meta-analysis, it has its point estimate. People are going to bicker about all these small things. It's not the moment to yet ask the question. The final tally is not yet done, but it will come. It will come and I think public sentiment will shift. The school closure tally that was always very unfavorable. The lockdown tally I think will likely be mostly like bloodletting. Bloodletting does actually work for a couple things. It worked for hemochromatosis. It does have a role, but it mostly didn't work. It didn't help George Washington when he had pneumonia. It didn't help most people throughout most time. And I think that's how most interventions are in humanity and society. That's not being pessimistic, that's being realistic. That's not being ahistoric, that's being historic. And so when I read a paper, I always try to think about, well, one, I wanna read it from an emotionally neutral place. I don't read papers you know, with strong passions about things. I'm not wedded to drugs. I'm not wedded to lockdown. I'm not wedded against law. I'm not against it either for, as prima facie when I read the paper, but I want to enter with a realistic idea of what people can accomplish, what people have done, a realistic idea of what medical practices and devices can accomplish and how often they succeed. And then I want to see the evidence. Is it very credible or is it modestly credible? Do they use real rock solid endpoints or do they use surrogate endpoints and surrogates of surrogates? And then as we see with this vaccine trial that we're gonna be talking about very soon, if the primary endpoint fails, can you look at a secondary endpoint? I see somebody says, well, the FDA said that we want a 50% risk reduction from vaccines, we'll approve the vaccine. That was what they said about a study where that was the primary endpoint, where you had pre-specified times you would look at something. That's not what they say about a secondary endpoint of a trial that failed the primary endpoint, and you can look at it potentially infinitely many times. The more you can look at something and pick and choose endpoints, you can always find something of significance. That's not what the FDA says. You have no alpha. You have no alpha error left to budget for these looks. What are you looking with? What credibility do you have when you look for finding these differences? You're very likely to look more when you want to find a win. And the moment you find the win, you stop looking. So it can introduce all these problems. So what should we think about science? What should we think about this lockdown paper? What should we think about all these studies we read? I think we need to realize that the human body is marvelously complex in sickness and in health. It's marvelously well adapted. There are always maladies that afflict us and we're not perfectly adapted to our circumstances. And we do have many, many drugs and devices and surgeries that actually make us better off than what our own ability to evolve has done. But of the universe of things people have tried to make their condition better and their health better, most of those things have failed. Most of the things throughout most of humanity have failed. Many of them hurt people, a small fraction of them, many of them were neutral. That's the other thing, the body is so resilient it can tolerate you swallowing all sorts of supplements that don't help, etc. Some of those things help, almost none of those things help a lot or they'd be visible to the naked eye. And you need randomization to separate these things, you really do. And how does this apply to COVID-19? I mean, we could have had randomized trials of school closures. We could have randomized trials of school opening. Actually, Atla Fretheim from Norway, he actually has written draft documents of this. We could have had many, many more randomized trials of masking. We really ought to. That is such a divisive issue, in part because it's such a visible symbol. Of course it was going to be divisive. It's a visible symbol, and it's used to police and lead to tribes, and it's almost like a political identity. Of course it was going to become so loaded. We needed to do many such studies, and we needed to do studies in the youth, because just because an intervention works in adults doesn't mean it works in children, doesn't mean it works in young children, particularly when it involves behavior and interaction and involves a virus with, an, with a gradient for risk that's so, so steep, which might have fundamentally s slightly different concerns and properties you need to think about at different ages, of course. So of course we needed more randomized trials there. Could we have had randomized trials of lockdown? I don't think we could have had a randomized trial of all of lockdown, but components of it could have been studied more rigorously. We didn't have to deploy it everywhere at the same time, irrespective of starting conditions. We could have asked ourselves if it might work under some circumstances, but perhaps not others. We didn't entertain that. 
And so my answer to this person's question is that science is the only path forward. There's never going to be anything better than science. It's the only way to learn truth from fiction. And there are many people who wear the badge of scientists, but there are few people who are scientists. Because being a scientist means you have a historical perspective of things. It means you're willing to consider data. But it also means you know all the pitfalls and you know what is possible and plausible and what is merely wishful thinking. So that's what you get on this channel, ruminations like this. It was a great question. It made me think a lot and I gave a slightly different answer because both of these are extemporaneous examples, extemporaneous speaking and response. But I think it's a really good question. How do we know what to trust? And I actually think that the goal of medical education is to empower trainees with that knowledge. And I think we fail so badly. We do all the wrong things. We don't focus. And that's why when I go look on Twitter, I see all these people, doctor, trained at, you know, et cetera, et cetera. They're not good at it. I mean, you, you really have to do a lot in this space. You have to do the research. You have to do it a lot. You got to do meta research, umbrella research, read sort of historical perspectives and get a sense of sort of the philosophy of science itself. And I think it's easy to succumb to the, the, the ultimate sin, which is that people are omnipotent. But we're often not. We often can't make things better. We often delude ourselves and we approve very costly products for many years. We subject a lot of people to a lot of harm and we think we do good, but we don't always do good. Many times we got it wrong. And the, the, the crux of it is we didn't subject our hypotheses to those gold standard rigorous appraisals. And that's actually the theme of my first book, Ending Medical Reversal. And uh, it's a theme of a lot of my work and a lot of our research. So if you like this, this is what you get on this channel. Like, subscribe, comment, leave a message down below. Um, ring that bell. Supposedly that's helpful. Uh, until next time.